Thank you very much. Um, so I'm Karen Ellis. I lead the private sector and markets program at the Overseas Development Institute, and I've been advising CDK on CDKN on CCD climate compatible development issues for the last uh, about two years. And this paper um, was really an attempt to start framing an agenda around this issue of climate compatible development (CCD), looking both at what are the drivers of CCD in different country contexts, and what are the challenges faced by policymakers trying to progress CCD in 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 their um, national policy processes. And this is based both on what CDKN has found through its experience over the last few years, and also on the wider literature on these issues. And we're doing this because we want to understand first how to make the case more effectively for CCD, and also how to overcome the barriers to it that have been identified at, at the country level. It's very much a work in progress, um, and we are seeking feedback from a whole range of sources. We've already presented this in a number of other fora as well, and got some very valuable feedback. So we would like feedback from yourselves as well, particularly on you know, the, any drivers or challenges you think we've missed, or areas where we sh that should place more emphasis. Uh, next, have we got a clicker? No, sorry, no. Okay. So, what is climate compatible development? Um, this diagram <coughs> attempts to show uh, what is quite a complex uh, issue. I mean, basically, in simple terms, I think what we mean is that it's about development. Obviously, that's our ultimate goal. Development but we believe that development can only be achieved if you take into account the impact of climate change on the produ uh, production that you're uh, undertaking in order to underpin that development. And ideally also that development should be delinked from carbon emissions. So that brings in the adaptation and the mitigation issues as well. And when you achieve all of those goals at the same time, you're in that sweet spot in the middle of the um, diagram, we call that climate compatible development. But I think also it's true to say that in some sectors, you have opportunities to promote develop and development and just one of those goals, you should take that opportunity. They're not always, they don't always have to be met at exactly the same moment, but we should be thinking about these issues whenever we develop our growth um, and uh, development trajectories. Now, these are the drivers and challenges that are covered in the paper. I won't have time to go through them all in detail, and in fact, some of the other speakers, I think, are going to cover some of them. So I'll, I'll whiz by some of them, but I'll focus on some of the others with a little bit more detail and, and some examples of where CDKN is already uh, engaging. So, the drivers. We suggest five interconnected economic and political drivers of progress on CCD. Um, as I said, based on uh, CDKN's experience and also the literature, the drivers do vary quite a lot between countries, um, depending on their level of development and what they produce, etc. So there's no real one-size-fits-all solution to this. Right, the first one, big one, is adaptation to build resilience, achieve growth and reduce poverty. Now this is particularly important for developing countries, even the lowest income developing countries. They really highlight this, this is one of the biggest drivers. We know that growth will be hit by climate change. There's quite a lot of evidence on that now. Um, often that's now been quantified. So in Ethiopia, for example, research suggests that without the development of a climate resilient and green economy, potential economic growth by 2025 will be halved. So that's a big impact. Uh, in Kenya, we know that the future impacts of extreme weather are expected to reduce GDP by around 3% a year by 2030, again, so quite significant impacts we're talking about. We also know poor people are likely to suffer most. Um, they often live in vulnerable areas. Uh, the 2007 and 8 um, UN Human Development Report showed how climate change will make it much harder to achieve the UN Millennium Development Goals. CCD can almost by definition reduce the costs of climate change because it's about adapting your production in order to cope with the effects of climate change. But we really need to quantify the benefits of CCD better than we're doing now, um, partly by estimating the costs of inaction because that's basically what's going to happen by default, business as usual, nothing changes, climate change is going to have a big impact on your future growth trajectory. Some of those numbers I've just talked about already show that, but we need to do that a lot more because it's making it very easy for politicians to ignore these issues at the moment. So that's one area where a, a much stronger evidence base would be useful, and CDKN is working to build that evidence base. 
The second issue is around energy security and access to natural resources. Another really big driver, particularly for some countries. Um, energy security is a big issue. Um, many developing countries are net oil importers. They are dependent on other countries for access to energy. They're dependent on international um, oil prices, and that makes them very vulnerable. So many countries are investing in renewable energy generation, domestic renewable energy, in order to improve their own sort of um, self-reliance. Um, CDKN supports quite a few of these kinds of initiatives. Um, for example, it's been supporting a regional approach to renewable energy generation for the Caribbean community, which would never have been possible by individual islands, of course, but um, a as a group, that's um, some a way that CDKN has been able to help that um, uh, particular policy area. Um, Securing access to land, water and energy has been another issue, growing issue, that's particularly highlighted by countries like China, which are obviously very populous and are growing fast. In their five-year plan, they have highlighted this as one of the biggest drivers and they have set out quite detailed plans and strategies for how they're going to tackle that over the next five years. Other countries, including low-income countries, are not perhaps... Um, um, focusing enough on this yet as it represents a significant threat to their growth. For many countries, food security will be the really big issue. There's increasing competition for land, for both for agricultural crops, both for food and also biofuels, also for forest conservation and for urbanisation. And all of these competing demands will significantly challenge the ability of countries to produce enough food for themselves and to export to other countries, which is... Um, which is driving those land grabs that we've heard about so much in, in the press. So uh, there's a lot to be done uh, here to help countries to um, maximise the productivity of their production, um, of their food production and uh, agricultural production. And there's a lot of scope, there's a lot of opportunities for triple wins here in terms of CCD, I would say. Okay. Okay. Speed up. Okay, this one I won't talk about in much detail because it's a subject to another whole uh, piece of work. There's a paper recently been published in ODI by uh, myself and a team on low carbon logic, which is where we've been looking at how you can think about new opportunities arising from climate change, mitigation and um, resource scarcity, how that will create opportunities for new technologies, solar, photovoltaics, hydropower, etc., some countries are already beginning to capitalise on that. There are also going to be new sources of competitive advantage and disadvantage arising from these changing patterns of trade, and it would be well for countries to think about what that means for them and their own growth and trade strategies. Also, if they want to continue accessing markets, they need to comply with standards of other countries, etc. So there's lots of opportunities and a few threats as well that countries need to be thinking about. Carbon finance was one of the opportunities that we had highlighted and has been seen as a real opportunity by many developing countries. It's the next one. But there's a big question around this now because, you know, people are beginning to think carbon markets have completely failed. Um, they failed to develop as fast as we'd hoped. There's more and more sort of negative publicity about them. Perhaps <coughs> they are just not going to succeed and we need to find alternative solutions. Hugely controversial and, and complicated issues. It's a real shame for many developing countries who spent a lot of resources trying to access those carbon markets for nothing. So they've been very disappointed by that. Uh, donor climate finance is another potential source, and donors are, you know, obviously they've made huge pledges to <coughs> of funding for these issues, but that disbursement has not kept up with the pledges. And there's another question around the extent to which any of that funding is actually additional to what they would have funded anyway through aid, um, normal aid. So this has been quite disappointing. And the fifth driver um, is uh, a bit different, actually, because the others have been underlying economic rationale. This is about political leadership. And we've seen that that can be a really important driver in some contexts. Um, uh, in Rwanda, for example, the president of Rwanda is seen to have been a real champion of this agenda, really driving it through government. It can either come from individuals or from particular ministries or other bodies. Um, uh, that leadership is often located in the Ministry of Environment, not always the strongest ministry to take it forward, but where you see that spreading to other ministries, like ministries of planning and finance, the leadership tends to become more effective and can really drive a sort of mainstreaming of these issues within economic planning. 
There's also an issue around national versus subnational leadership, but I believe one of the other speakers is going to talk about that, so I will leave that to them. So, the challenges and potential solutions and the enabling factors that we need to develop further to overcome some of these challenges. First of all is, of course, the costs of um, CCD. And these mean both the budgetary costs associated with implementing some of the policies we've talked about. There's also massive opportunity costs for some countries associated with the fossil fuel reserves they already have or the forests they already have, which they are, you know, understandably very tempted to exploit. So how can we um, overcome these costs? There's an issue of high short-term costs and a long-term gain from CCD. Um, and countries often tend to be quite short-termist. Um, potential solutions include carbon markets, which I've already talked about, but which have not been doing very well. Financial markets could also <coughs> much better support some of the necessary investments, but they tend to be quite short-termist as well. They're not willing to wait for the payoff period to, to happen. And I think the private sector will also fund its own adaptation to a large extent when this becomes more obviously necessary. Some of the big multinationals are already thinking these issues through. They're already thinking how will climate change affect their business in different countries and, and responding appropriately. So they will fund quite a lot of their own adaptation. Some of the smaller firms obviously have less capacity to think through these issues. Okay. Um, interest groups opposed to change. CCD, like all other development and growth processes, creates both winners and losers. The losers will always oppose change. The losers in this case, unfortunately, are companies, fossil fuel based companies, who are very powerful. So they are a very important vested interest opposed to CCD, which is very difficult to tackle. Some potential solutions here are things like dialogue processes, which bring together all the different parties to the table and, in a transparent manner, thrash out the sort of pros and cons of different ways forward and can help to negotiate solutions. Uh, CDKN's been doing that kind of thing. For example, it recently supported the government of Aguila to uh, progress a uh, renewable energy strategy by bringing all the different interest groups around a table to get a more informed decision. Compensation mechanisms can also help to buy off the losers from these things, and that could be companies. could also be people who lose their jobs from <coughs> some of these um, uh, reforms. Civil society campaigns can also be used to build public support for reform that offsets the vested interests opposed to it. A lack of information is a big issue. There's a weak evidence base often to underpin the uh, CCD decisions. Not much is known about the trade-offs associated with some of the outcomes that are likely to happen. Data <coughs> is, li is limited and you know, when data <coughs> is produced it needs to be accessible and credible. Some solutions here include participative processes for building the evidence base. We have things like the MAPS approach, mitigation action plans and scenarios, which is a participative process to develop the evidence base, bringing a load of stakeholders around the table and thinking about the different scenarios going forward. And that's been implemented in countries like South Africa and now in Latin America. Um, and then there's a need for new metrics and methodologies, which we don't really have much we don't haven't made much progress on that internationally as yet and that's really a work in progress and that's where i think a lot of work will happen in the in the near future short termism i've already mentioned um uh you know the costs are short term the benefits tend to be long term but electoral pressures are always quite immediate and so that's a real problem um, difficult economic conditions and the financial situation at the moment means that you know most governments are focused on the short term including our own so uh, how can we ask developing countries to think in the long term when we can't do that ourselves there's also a lack of democratic accountability in many developing countries where the focus is on short term rent seeking rather than um, any kind of long term development trajectory that's um, best for society as a whole Try and embed CCD in law and longer term processes so that it's not vulnerable to, to electoral cycles. And also trying to build civil society support, private sector engagement, so that some of these processes are ongoing even when governments change. State capacity constraints are obviously a big issue. There's often a very small number of people trying to take forward a huge agenda. Both technical and institutional capacity constraints. Uh, CDKN is doing a lot on this in terms of capacity building, and I believe um, one of the other speakers is going to talk a bit about this as well. So I'll, I'll leave that just to say there's also opportunities for um, non-state driven solutions such as voluntary self-regulation, things like the Carbon Disclosure Project, which create incentives for the private sector to reduce emissions off their own bat without any necessary pol policy stimulus to do so. 
institutional constraints. Again, so that's going to be covered by uh, another speaker. Lots of issues around how these process are, processes are actually managed within the government and some emerging lessons about how best to manage those processes. Uh, and finally, the technological constraints. One of the issues we have is that we don't really know which of these technologies are really going to take off. We don't know which ones are going to become the most cost effective. We don't really know about the future trajectory of fossil fuel prices, climate change policy, how much mitigation is actually going to be agreed internationally, what are the local impacts of climate change. These are huge areas of uncertainty which undermine incentives to invest by the private sector. Some solutions include setting up a clear policy framework so that at least uh, private sector knows what governments are planning to do over the longer term. Also, there's you know, public guarantees or risk sharing mechanisms which would give the private sector a bit more um, certainty of at least a minimum level of return, which would enable them to have more confidence in their investments and cause lots of scope for, for research and cross-country lesson learning to um, facilitate and uh, overcome some of those gaps in knowledge. Uh, and that's it. So we just want to hear your feedback and, uh, and have a good discussion about it. Thank Very you. Good, thanks. You know, you've almost convinced me with this list of challenges that it's too difficult. So imagine you're in the lift and the lift door opens and President Obama walks in. Uh, and you've got 10 floors, 30 seconds, to explain to him why actually, despite this long list, there's something in it for him. What do you say? Always <laughs> <laughs> good for the million dollar question, Simon. Um, you could use one of Blair's phrases, if you want to feel a hand of history on your shoulder, then you should do something about this because the, the US government is obviously in a great place to be a game changer in this. They're failing to do so at the moment. And if anything, they're going in very much the wrong direction in terms of things like the gas um, revolution that, that, that they're behind. But, if, but they have the opportunity to break the deadlock, to give a bit in terms of unilateral um, space and negotiating space that other countries would then respond to. It's all about building goodwill. We've seen a lot uh, from the WTO experience, for example, of how get the in, uh, all the international <coughs> players together, they all battle about who's going to you know, do the minimum effort. That's the wrong way to think about it. It should be a collaborative process where everyone is willing to give what they can to solve this major global problem. And if he could at least put some vision out there which would set that in place, then that would be a huge impact on the world. Very good. Thank you. We might come back to that question because I think if I was President Obama, I would like you to say to me, here are three reasons why you doing this will transform the prospects for your voters. You know, and, and I, I'd, I'd like us to come back to whether we can construct an answer along those lines, dealing with the challenges that you've laid out. That was a really helpful and systematic overview, Karen. Thank you. Um, Emma, we'll ask you to react.